So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians Special Board Meeting. My name is Dr. Carol Mountain, and I'm the Board President. I would like to call this meeting to order at 2.04 p.m. First, some housekeeping information on how this meeting will be conducted. This meeting will be held via WebEx on Thursday, June 17, 2021. I ask the board members and staff to mute their microphones to eliminate background noise, and when they are ready to speak, they can unmute. WebEx has a feature to virtually raise your hand, and I ask board members to use this function after each agenda item if they would like to comment or have questions. If we need a motion, I will call for a motion, and any board member can raise their hand, identify themselves, and make a motion. If you are seconding a motion, please raise your hand, unmute, identify yourself, and second the motion. I will take a roll call vote for each motion. Again, please identify yourself by name each time you speak so our audience knows who is speaking. We will take public comment on each agenda item. If you wish to provide public comment, click on the Q&A button near the bottom center of your WebEx session. This brings up the Q&A chat box. To request time to speak, make sure the Ask menu is set to All Panelists and type, I would like to make a public comment. Attendee lines will be unmuted in the order the requests are received, and you will be allowed to present public comment. Please note, your line will be muted at the end of the allotted public comment duration, which is three minutes. You will be notified when you have 10 seconds remaining. Your name is not necessary, but please indicate how would you, you would like us to identify you. For the sake of efficiency, the executive officer will respond directly to public comment or defer to the appropriate staff person or council. For questions directed to the board members, I will either answer the question or direct it to board members. I will now do an alphabetical roll call to establish a quorum. I ask each board member to respond here after I say their names. Aisha Brown. Ms. Brown? It appears that Ms. Brown is having some technical difficulties. Let me double check with her real quick. I'll be right Thank back. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll move on and come back to that one. Uh, Alita Carpenter. Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Alita. Uh, John Dierking. Uh-oh. I think I heard him very faintly. Okay. Um, Abraham Hill. Abraham here. Thank you. Ken Maxey. Here. Thank you. Tara Rooks. Hi, this is Tara. I'm here. Thank you. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. Melissa Rubel-Calva. Present, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Cheryl Turner. Here. Thank you. Um, Vicki, should we, should I recall uh, Taisha or is she having it? I don't see her on here anymore. She's on, she's, ha she's a panelist. Yeah. I see her on here. Ms. Okay. Brown. I've unmuted her microphone for her, so maybe we could reach you that way. Ms. Brown? Can you indicate that you're here, please? I've also sent her a private message. Okay. And I received no response yet. Okay, well, based on the roll call, we have an established forum. And we will now move on to item two, introduction of the board staff. Uh, Ms. Yamaguchi, please introduce yourself and your staff. Thank you, Madam President. Elaine Yamaguchi, Executive Officer. With us today, we have Ann Schumann, Sue Ellen Clayworth, Beth DeYoung, Vicki Saavedra, Vicki Lyman, Doris Pierce, and Antoinette Wood. And if anybody popped in after I looked at the, the list, I apologize. Thank you. Legal counsel, could you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Kenneth Swenson, Board General Counsel. 
Thank you. Uh, the purpose of this special meeting is to ask the board to take action on some matters that will not wait until our regular meeting in August. That is item three. Um, item four has six separate items. The first four were discussed by the board's legislative and regulations committee. The chair, Mr. John Durking, will present the recommendations from the committee. And I will call for public comment after any board questions or comments and then ask for the vote. Mr. Durkin? Mr. Hill, can you give me another microphone check, please? It seems we're having some technical difficulties, yes. It does appear so, and I don't really understand what's going on unless everything else is on on strike because of the heat wave. Um, Mr. Deerking had been having some difficulties, Ms. Carpenter pointed out earlier. <clears throat> Mr. Deerking, are, are you are you hearing? Mm -hmm. When he first checked on, I faintly heard him say, yes, he was here. But now it appears that his microphone is not working again. And Mr. Hill got out, he jumped out of the meeting and came back in, so I re-promoted him. Okay. Now it seems that his microphone is not working. This is Abraham. Uh, this is oh, there you are, Mr. Hill. Thank you. Thank you. I'm still unable to touch bases with Ms. Brown. Uh, Ms. Yamaguchi, how, how do you, excuse me, how do you suggest we move forward? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, what we could do um, until we have got Mr. Deerking up and audible, we could move into, oh golly, um, item 4C if you like. Uh, I'm going to say yes to that. Okay. And I'm going to ask if you will um, take it from here. Wonderful. So, um, that's great. So before you, we have a number of pieces of, of information. The, there's a cover memo with some recommendations and background. We have, of course, um, the concepts for discussion, and we have um, a timeline, and we also have a, a mocked up draft for um, the new program approval application, something of a call for, call for applications, if you will. Um, the staff worked a lot with um, a, a variety of different scenarios and we we arrived at at this as a concept so the point before us today is to to really look at these program concepts <laughs> that was interesting um did everybody yes, just hear yes. that nice echo yes we did i do apologize um, it's my my longing to be a dj i'm sorry um, so the, the mission before us today is to discuss and approve the program concepts. Well, that's, that would be, um, attachment one to the 4C packet. Um, as the board will recall, we talked a bit about this a couple of times, uh, once in the context of, um, preparing and, and approving our response to the, um, the legislature's background paper after our sunset hearing. And then again, briefly last time. Um, in the bigger context of um, discussing essentially the way we do um, program approvals now 
and some some ways to uh, improve that, make it more efficient, more transparent. Um, because bluntly, the problem has been that we've had a waiting list that has been inconsistent in its movement. It's it's taken some programs way too long to to be assigned and and then to be approved to to start doing business. And it's it's an inconsistent process. It's um, needs some work. So what we have put together here is a is a proposal for a new and we think much better way of doing business. Now I, I will say as a footnote that um, it, it, we believe and we would advise the board that we cannot cannot really make these processes work unless we are also authorized to um, to uh, to um, charge the fees to the programs um, in terms of new program approval, in terms of continuing approval, and in terms of provisional approval. So but we'll come back to that part in a bit. So um, really briefly, what we want to talk about a bit is this new program approval process, and we've bulleted out how we envision this working. This and and remember, this is this is a draft for discussion, but we would be best served in being able to sharpen these concepts and, and have them as, as um, specific and as, as tight as we possibly can. We had an initial conversation with um, the folks in the Assembly and Senate committees who aren't really willing to say, oh, yes, that's the way to go, but have said that this is interesting to them and they believe that a lot of what we have to say here meets the concerns that their chairs had had expressed in our hearing. So with that, you know, um, why don't I pause here um, if any of the board members have any questions or comments on number one, new program approval process. John Deere can have a question if I may. Certainly, sir. Can, am I can you hear me? Can yeah, now. Great. Wonderful. I'm connected. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> it. I'm I'm sorry, I thought you had a question. No, that, that was my question. I'm I'm so sorry. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, fine. Sorry about that. So anyways, yeah, um, if, are there any other questions from the board members or from 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 folks here. This is the moderator. I just uh, made contact with Ms. Brown and she was having problems getting her mic to work. So she had to log off and now she's gonna try to come back in. Wonderful. Thank you, Vicki. So, all right. All right, so well, if, if the program approval process um, remember, th this doesn't vary tremendously from uh, the concepts we talked about in our, our May board meeting. Um, but if I could, you know, if again, like, let me call again for any comments or questions. And at this point, Madam Chair, if there's anybody public who wants to uh, comment or make ask questions, I'd be delighted. Elaine, I just want you to clarify for everybody that there's two separate things here. There's the that what you're you're talking about right now is just the process, and then you'll talk about the fee structure um, in 4D. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, exactly right. I just think it's easy for people to get confused about what exactly we're addressing with 4C. I know I do. Um, so, anyways, at this point, our the, the staff's recommendation is for the board to discuss and approve the program concepts, um, and secondly, to authorize the executive officer to negotiate this proposal with the legislative staff. And I would also recommend that the board reaffirm that the implementation of this pilot program or any other processes that we, we develop be contingent upon statutory authority to assess the fees for the work that the board provides to our educational programs. Do we, are there, is there any public comment? I see none at this time. Thank you so much. Um, 
Is there a motion on the concepts as described? John Deerkin would so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Abraham L. Just second. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, um, Mr. Swenson, I, um, would you want to provide some some guidance on the phrasing of a motion? Certainly. The current motion is to approve the concepts, but there are other elements in the staff recommendation. It would be up to the chair whether the various elements should be taken up by separate motion or a combined motion. I can make recommendations as to individual motions that would co cover the various staff recommendations, or I can make a proposal and recommendation for an overall motion that would cover those issues. I would like, I appreciate very much a recommendation on uh, a proposal that would cover the whole thing. Is any, does anyone else have a comment on that? Board members? I have none. All right, so the recommended form of motion would be as follows. Number one, approve the concepts described in the program concepts as set forth in attachment one to the memorandum dated June 11th, 2021, which is part of the special meeting agenda materials for this item, item 4C. Number two, authorize the executive office in consultation with the executive committee to negotiate this proposal with legislative staff in order to develop bill language to effectuate those concepts. Three, reaffirm that implementation of the pilot program and or any processes for improving the program approval process is contingent upon statutory authorization to assess fees for the work that the board provides to the educational programs and recognize that if the legislature is not inclined to approve the fees, the board must move forward with a new program approval process that is vetted through the board and stakeholders. And four, direct staff to take those actions reasonably necessary to develop bill language to effectuate the program concepts to study the potential effects of any proposed bill language and to assess its fiscal and budgetary impact through consultation with the department's budget office to include consultation on the potential need for a third party fee study on the proposed school fees. So that would be the language of the recommended motion. Thank you. That's a motion. So this then would be the language of Mr. Deerking's motion, which I seconded. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So can I take a roll call vote on that motion? Oh, Madam Mr. Chair, Turner has her hand up. Is there a discussion? Madam Chair, we'll have to have public comment before there can be a vote. And a discussion. Okay, let's, have a, let's have a discussion from the board first. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm not sure if I'm mixing up issues, fees versus the concepts. It looks like it's combined, though. Um, and I just have a question. So part of the reason, oh, there's two reasons that we're pursuing the fees. One has to do with revenue and costs. But the other that's mentioned in the memo is also that there is some sort of backlog or wait list. And so can you explain how assessing a fee would improve the efficiency of getting the programs through the process? Because um, I'm not clear on that one. Thank you for the question, Ms. Turner. Um, 
there's a there's several pieces there i think um we believe of course first and foremost that the programs have been benefiting from BVNPT's uh, overall structure, which has been almost entirely funded by our licensees and applicants and some CE providers <clears throat> since its inception. And um, essentially, uh, the education unit, I would say that there's something somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of our of our overall budget goes to working with the schools and programs. Um, that's a large amount to be absorbed and we can no longer in good conscience just depend on the applicants and licensees to fund the entirety of this board. That's you know the first and foremost piece. The second piece I think um, and, and and this I think is is really just it's almost psychological in a way, but it's also just a fair business practice that we believe that because our application process, the the the, app, the the process for requesting approval to start a new program has been very rudimentary. We haven't asked for a, a great amount of pre-work. Basically, we've asked them to file um, not much more than a letter of intent with a, we would like to open a, a new program in Riverside County and something like that. And then they've been placed on a waiting list um, and, and, and waited um, so that when, you know, with um, a better flow, a, a smaller list, if you will, um, that that period of waiting isn't very long, and um, it it seems like it would move expeditiously. But the problem has been over the past several years, um, and probably even back before uh, before I started here, is that one there's a lot of um, inconsistencies in the ways that the proposing entities have a approach this obligation and, and basically this process of, of a wait list has kind of had a dual and, and competing problem of programs that are absolutely ready to open their doors and, and, and teach students. If they're put on a waiting list for a year and a half, two years, they lose their momentum, they lose their resources. Um, any kind of a, um, agreement they've had with um, a possible venue or faculty members or program directors Oftentimes, those go by the wayside if they have to wait. And conversely, I think we've we've also seen that even if a program has been waiting for a year and a half, two years, they haven't necessarily gone about the the um, the prep work, if you will, of developing their policies and their procedures and their curriculum, of looking at to get at least you know something of a commitment for resources, program directors, staff. And, and so consequently, they're sometimes they've caught completely flat footed when they're notified that um, you're in the 10th position on the waiting list um, and NEC is probably going to be assigned to you within three months. And so if they're caught completely flat footed, that starts them from scratch and that's a really lengthy process. So we believe that by changing the way the, um, the programs are approved, in other words, kind of front loading um, the amount of information, the amount of work they do before they're considered, and by adding that fee, um, essentially we're, we're thinking that this has the combined effect that programs will not approve, will not propose a new start, a new program until they are really ready. And this is why, this is how we've gone about the, the design of, of this approach that we want to stress, is your program ready to, to be working through the process with the NECs? Is this program providing a service, you know, is it ready? Is it sustainable? Is it um, serving the population? Is it, you know, in a more um, clustered area or is it someplace that there's not a, a new PT or VN program? So we believe that these things combined make for a better way of, of approving programs. Um, but you're right that it's it they're they're simultaneously two different issues, but one big issue because all things considered, I believe you know and you know that the board has talked about the necessity of the school fees for many years. Um, 
and we we do believe that this solves you know obviously we we have fiscal issues fiscal needs for you know strengthening our revenue stream but also this is the right thing to do does that answer your question it, it does oh, i'm just um, wondering okay so is the only reason that there is a backlog is that the schools are caught flat-footed no there's a lot of reasons for the for the backlog and and some of it some of it is would have been avoidable but some of it was not and some of it unfortunately i i have to lay at covid's door um essentially um back in 2018 2017 2018 um i think you'll recall that we were very short staffed with our necs we didn't have a supervising nec um and so those necs that we did have working um were pretty much doing everything and so there there that was starting to accumulate a bit of backlog because the necs do um a vast amount of things as we found that you know they're they're overseeing their own assigned existing programs they're providing policy research on scope of practice and then each of them have a couple three new programs to be working with to um to get them up and running so there was only so much that could be done on a regular on, on with that staffing structure so when we started here in about 2018 um, when we started, you know, first off by having the great good fortune of getting a very, very qualified supervising NEC, Marie Cordero, and then we were able to add, you know, two or three new NECs, and when we were starting to get that momentum, so our plan, huh, ironically, we were at this position in about... Um, I would say the fall of 2019 that we believed that come 2020 we were going to be turning the corner because we had that full staff and they were all ready and and trained and working together as a team we believed that 2020 was going to be the year we turned the corner but then we had covid and the necs found themselves spending something like 85 to 90 something percent of their time just working with the existing programs to make certain that they were able to keep everything moving and to find ways to um, find some workarounds to make sure that their students weren't just stopped. So that's most of, 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 the, of the, um, the accumulation of the backlog. But the other part of the backlog is very truly the fact that the process has been so very um, mm, I think backward, if you will, that that we haven't had that first provide that that assessment of needs and readiness. Um, why you want to put a program right here? Are you ready to do it? What's it going to look like? What's your your philosophy? So I think that those things combined have made the the, the backlog that we see today. Thank you, Ms. Yamaguchi. That was uh, excellent. Uh, are, there, oh, are there comments from the public? I see none at this time. There are no hands raised. Actually, Mr. Cody Piazzi, who has raised his hand, I will unmute his microphone. Is that a public comment? Yes, one moment. Okay. Um, this is Sarah. Uh, Vicki, you still have host role. Did you um, want to pass that over to me? Yes, I'm doing so. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm like I can't unmute people. <laughs> I 
Are we still waiting for a public comment? We are, Madam Chair. All right, I'll be um, unmuting uh, Kobe's mic now. Ah, thank you very much. I'm so sorry for that delay. Um, Madam Chair and members, uh, I, I, this is Kobe Pizzotti with the California Association of Psychiatric Technicians. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Yamaguchi's explanation was uh, very succinct and to the point of what the actual problem is. This, this issue has certainly gone on for a very long period of time um, where the, the programs have submitted you know, very bare applications um, that take a lot of hand-holding to get all the way through the process. And this has been going on for well over a decade since I've been working with CAP. Um, and we've been working with the board. So uh, I think the, the issue of um, kind of making sure that programs are ready to go um, and making sure that the applications are filled out and 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 properly uh, established, so there's less immediate work for the NECs to do uh, in order to get a program uh, moving forward. I, I think that's just a great idea, and I think actually establishing a fee for that will put some incentive uh, to to making sure that there's more complete and initial applications. Um, the question that I had is, will this fee that is established apply to those uh, that are currently on the waiting list that are backlogged? So that would be my question. Thank you. Um, Mr. Pizzotti, thanks for the question, and, and I appreciate your, your kind words as well. At this point in time, we, we have not <clears throat> had a, a, a firm yay or nay on where it is that, that, that any sort of grandfathering would start or stop. Um, I think it's absolutely fair that the programs that have been assigned that are being worked with the NECs are are considered as you know part of, of the the early cohort and, and ergo not affected by the fees and then people who have just applied or who basically have not started doing any work with the NECs might be subject to the fees but then remember though that this is um this whole procedure has has not yet been completely ironed out so it may well be that if we go through this this new process where we have the uh, the application for consideration for a new program that essentially the programs that are ready move ahead and while that means that they would be considered um, more quickly more more thoroughly um, but they would also be subject to the fees is is that what you're asking I think in summary, though, what, what I would say is we have not negotiated that finally with the legislature will certainly want to weigh in on, on where that goes. Was there a final comment? No, no, I was just saying thank you. That does answer my question. Uh, that that's uh, what what I had suspected that both the Senate and Assembly BNP committees will probably want to have uh, the final word on that. As always. Um, I see that Ms. Brown has her hand raised. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, my statement will definitely um, uh, expose the fact that it's important that um, we have a diverse board and so I think that um, this is greatly uh, affecting Black Ram programs and nonprofits 
and it adds to the disparities in, in health care. Uh, no small, there's not a small organization that can afford to wait 36, um, even 18 months. That's a long time. And uh, can the fees be based on annual revenue, uh, more specifically, like um, annual revenue of the organization, regardless uh, as uh, if it's a profit or nonprofit? Don't you think that would be fair? Ms. Brown, I appreciate the con the comments and, and I absolutely agree with, with your concept here because I 100% agree that making certain that the schools we have in this state represent a, a broad diversity and, and certainly um, an equitable diversity. So our problem with this, and, and, and I wanted to, to point out that the continuing approval fee we did look very very carefully at a way to do this in a um in a better way so that these smaller programs um smaller community-based programs are are basically the continuing approval fees do adequately i think accurately represent um the workload that the necs would be um engaging with them so you know, as as we've been working forward over the past couple of years, um, the NECs and I have been kind of talking back and forth about the work is technically the same from big school, small school, public school, private school, but it's magnified, it's multiplied actually really by, you know, the same amount of work, but then it's multiplied by the fact that instead of you have one one or two cohorts of 20 students, you have eight or 12 cohorts of 40 students. And so the work, the, the, the information that the NECs are, are studying and analyzing and, and making their, basing their recommendations, it is a substantial amount more work. So this is why we, we look really hard at the way that the continuing approval fee would be assessed. Now the new approval fee, and I know actually that Dr. Mountain as well, has some some concerns about this. I don't quite know just now how we can make sure that um, that the way we we are proposing to move forward now doesn't completely disenfranchise these new small community based programs from wanting to open a program. And I think um, the way that we had we had originally conceived of, of this move forward would be in the nature of a pilot program so that we would also be looking as we worked with the way that we have this work um, laid out or the way it will be laid out when it's finally approved, um, that we also have an advisory committee that's working with us, studying how things are going, but also discussing issues just like that to make certain that we can find a way to accommodate programs just like that because like I said I firmly believe that that's essential to California's well-being to our health and certainly it, it it fits absolutely in with with DCA and BVNPT's prime mission which is to protect um, consumers um, so that you know what we're talking about and I think what what you would had been um, talking about is making certain that communities, especially underrepresented communities, communities of color, have one, this career path available to them, but two, they have healthcare professionals that understand their communities and that are representative of their communities even. So like I said, this is, it's a personal deep commitment for myself. So, you know, some of the things that we had talked about um, peripherally that, you know, that we believe that we could work with um, an advisory committee on is could we find ways could we find you know um external funding for from say um the state department of ed the california student aid commission and sorry about this dr mountain the college the community college's chancellor's office could there possibly be um language in a budget trailer bill from the state that would 
provide like block grant funding for programs who wanted to open a program specifically to provide this. And, um, and interestingly enough, one of the things that we had talked about here was um, a better way to partner with, for example, um, tribal communities because they have these rural health care, they have their own clinics and infrastructure, but to, to my knowledge, you know, nobody is helping them and they're not able to really like accept, you know, um, nursing students or, or new nurses to help them to go to work um, with the tribal members. There are so many little issues like that, that this initial movement doesn't cover. And I, I absolutely know that. Um, but like I said, the way, the reason we wanted to couch this as something of a pilot program was so that we could first address this really desperate need to move forward with um, getting these programs up and running, but also then so that we could along the way study how we can build that foundation. We could build that and make that more sustainable. And so I apologize for, for rambling a bit there. That's okay, but I do have a follow up. I, I'd like to know Sorry. that, you know, what if um, this doesn't work? You know, um, what if it causes more disparities in the California uh, healthcare system and um, block grants should be made available? And um, mm -hmm. can we as a board move to make this possible? Because I think uh, people have been disenfranchised that are trying to do the good work by training um, mm -hmm. having the programs there. And so I'm I'm really, I, and I think we're in a motion. I, I know we're in a motion, so I won't keep going on, but I do have more to say. So well, thank you for that answer, though. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate the conversation, Ms. Brown. I really do, because, you know, and, and, and truthfully, remember that this is, you know, first off, this is the beginnings of a process that we hope will be um, fine-tuned along the way, but also, Remember that the board itself, and especially the um, the Education and Practice Committee, are going to be working on this assiduously over the years. So that, like I said, we're going to be we're going to be working on this. We're going to be, not, and not just this, but I think the um, there's all kinds of peripheral pieces that all need to be brought into play. So I, I I believe that we will definitely be able to continue that conversation and and take it where it needs to go. Thank you. Cheryl Turner. Yeah, on that, that same point, uh, so with the initial application fee um, that's being applied across the board to nonprofits, low income areas, or historically disadvantaged areas, uh, yeah, that could very well discourage uh, schools in those areas from submitting applications if they have to pay the fee up front. And then, in addition to that, have to still be waiting on a waiting list, which is why I asked about how, how it helps to speed up the system. Um, and then, as you mentioned, by the time you come around, you know, our board, BBMPT comes around to them, they lose their, you know, director of nursing. They lose their lease uh, for a location because they can't continue to pay the monthly lease. Um, you know, by the time that they're considered to be opened as a school. Um, so, so these are, are definitely concerns that, that we need to take a look at. Well, that's exactly right, Ms. Turner, and that's exactly the situation we have right now. And that's why what we want to do here is, as I said, kind of upend that process so that, you know, essentially, you know, let me see if I can, I can, I can express this without absolutely chewing it up. Um, what we're envisioning here is, so we have this, we have this list right now of about 45 programs that want to uh, open a new place. Um, we believe that if we were authorized for this pilot program, and, and by the way, the legislative staff don't like it when I say this, um, Basically, that list kind of goes away because what we do instead is we communicate with those 45 proposers and say, here's, here's what we need to do. You, here's how 
we will approve new programs. So you provide this application with, you know, all the information on, on the rubric that's laid out in, I believe that's attachment three of 4C. Um, you provide all this information going forward so that the the several stages of, of, of program approval happen that initially they're they're looked at they're scored um, a panel um, evaluates them ranks them according to the rubric and the board has the um, the that last call where they approve x number of new programs for this one cohort and that that whole process is supposed to take six months or so so like i said the issues the concerns you're, you're expressing are dead on exactly what we're working with right now the concepts that we're trying to move forward here that we're, we're discussing in terms of a pilot program or, or something in that way it changes all of those things it does not change um, the issue that you and Ms. Brown have both expressed and, and that I'm deeply sympathetic with, and that is the impact that the smaller programs might experience. And But the thing is, is that at this point, um, the option that they have, because I, I, I firmly expect um, that when we are authorized to, to move forward the way we've laid this out, I believe, I strongly, strongly believe that when we communicate with the 45 people on that list and then we extend it out to the greater community, what's what will happen is a lot of the people who are, the 45 people there are going to look at this and think, we're not ready to do that and we'll wait till July or we'll wait till next January. Um, and as I said, the, the unfortunate side effect of that is that if these smaller programs that are nonprofits and community based are are amongst that that does kind of um, sway or sl or slant even really um, our our diversity of the, of our programs that we we regulate and that is something that we want to be very very certain that the board and its advisory committee and its staff are thinking through as we watch the way we, we move forward, that we start thinking and discussing and, and providing some proposals of how we counter that, how we work around that, how we make certain that it is a fair and equitable system on the, on the whole of it, but that it is also a system that is looking to develop underserved communities. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Great, you. thank you. Stand in mind. Yeah. Are there any further comments? Okay. Um, I would like to reread the proposal um, since we're going to be voting on it. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands what it is. So the proposal that we're voting on is one, to approve the concepts described in the program concepts as set forth in attachment one to the memorandum dated June 11, 2021, which is part of the special meeting materials for agenda item 4C. Two, to authorize the executive officer in consultation with the executive committee to negotiate this proposal with legislative staff in order to develop bill language to effectuate those concepts. Three, reaffirm that implementation of the pilot program and or any other processes for improving the program approval process is contingent upon statutory authority to assess fees for the work that the board provides to the educational programs and recognize that if the legislator is not inclined to approve the fee, the board must move forward with a new program approval process that is vetted through the board and stakeholders. And four, direct staff to take those actions reasonably necessary to develop bill language to effectuate the program concepts 
to study the potential effects of any proposed bill language and to assess its fiscal and budgetary impact through consultation with the department's budget office to include consultation on the potential need for a third party fee study on the proposed school fees. I would now like to take a roll call vote. Ms. Brown. Yes. I'm sorry, was that yes? Yes, it's yes. yes. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter. Yes. Mr. Durkin. Yes. Mr. Hill. Yes. Mr. Maxey. Yes. Ms. Rooks. Yes. Ms. Rubalcava. Yes. Ms. Turner. Yes. And I am a yes. So that is a unanimously passed uh, for for C. Uh, Mr. Durking, since your mic has returned, would you mind? Um, we can go back to number four uh, A two. Program path standards for vocational nursing programs. Oh, I'm Madam Chair, four A one, please. Four A one. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Durking. I just don't understand what's going on in the airwaves today. It appears that we are having additional problems. Okay. Mr. Deerkey? It looks like he's trying to hmm, let me make contact with him and see if he needs some more help. Hmm. In the meantime, Madam Chair, would you want to go on to um, the fee item? I believe that is 4D. I think that makes a lot of sense since we've kind of already been talking about it. That would be awesome. Thank you. It is true. It is true. See, the two are, are so very, very interwoven. Um, so the board will recall that um, last May, uh, the board authorized staff to seek legislation to charge school fees. Um, <clears throat> and the structure we had approved was $25,000 for the filing of an application for approval. $25,000 for authorizing continuing approval, and then a $5,000 processing and monitoring for programs that are on provisional approval every six months, but not more, but not, uh, but for schools on provisional for three consecutive years would result in the board removing them from the list of approved schools. And this was based on, on our, our research and our understanding of the situation as it was now over the past year of course we've had so many conversations and truthfully the world has kind of changed around us so just as you know we were just discussing the way that new programs are approved and the way we would like to change that um, and also just the way that um, all the information is processed and that we do believe that one of the critical flaws in the system has been um, the irregular communications to and from the proposers or the programs and our staff. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that the legislature has already put in some, some cursory language that would provide um, more structure in terms of communication that would enable the board to require more timely responses and establish consequences for the failure to comply. The, you know, so basically, they can't just go off to France for six months and then come back. Uh, we need to 
make certain that once they are working with the NECs that that communication and those deadlines and it goes both ways of course that the programs have the right to expect the NECs and, and the board staff to respond in a timely basis as well. <clears throat> so what we've done here, and we've done a bit of research again on, on the fees and what we would recommend first and foremost is that we amend slightly the, the two parts, two of the three parts that we had approved in May of 2020, and that is to break up that approval of new program fees um, in three stages so that when you file your application, there's the fee of $7,500. When you're assigned to the NEC, there's another payment of $7,500. And when you are in the final approval, there's the final payment of $10,000. We think um, one of the things we would suggest, of course, is that um, we, we, we would negotiate, I think, um, program uh, the way that that was, you know, if there were need for waivers, if there was a change in demand and supply. Um, but I wanted to point out that um, the new program approval fees fund that NECs work with the program for its first four years until they're considered for continuing approval. So I, I, it sounds like a large amount of money. It is a large amount of money, but this is, is essentially a four-year consulting agreement fee. And, um, and, I, and I, you know, we talked about this already, but I do know that it is still going to be problematic in, in some areas. The, um, the other thing we want to change a bit is um, the, the provisional approval fee. Um, we want to continue the, the way this is assessed, the $5,000 per six months. Um, and with that, that idea that schools need to be off provisional within three years, um, we would want to make certain that that is um, basically in effect for pro programs on or after um, any legislation takes effect. But what we, um, but as I said, this is um, principally the same as the structure that the board approved in May of 2020. What we do want to ch um, discuss in terms of changes is that continuing approval fee. And this is, um, this is, I think, where we're able to at least support the existing schools that I know um, are, are, some of them have, are having a really hard time. I, I absolutely want that, want to make certain that, that we don't push anybody out of business. So what we've done is we've worked up three possible models for the board to consider and approve today. <clears throat> Model one is based purely on a program's maximum number of students. So this is the, when, when, when the board approves um, a program's, you know, a request to admit students, this is the maximum amount that they are, they're authorized to, to accept. So we would charge uh, a small, a very small program, and we're defining that by, um, let's see, something like if you have fewer than 25 students, that would be um, the, defined as the small program, and they would be assessed that $5,000 fee. A medium program, which would be between 26 and 75 students, and that would be that um, $7,500 fee. The larger program, 76 to 150, would be um, that 15000 And the very, very large programs that are over 151 students would be assessed a $25,000 fee. Um, that would be model one. The model two and model three are, are slightly different. They're based first on that um, student population, but it's based on kind of a, a factor of the number of cohorts. So again, um, and the, the only real difference here is that model two would have the small programs paying $7,500 and model three would have the small programs pay $5,000. The others would be as as you see in, in in these. So either way, you know this is this is certainly um, not an exact science, and <clears throat> we would uh, obviously um, by getting statutory authority, there would certainly be a ceiling above the, these amounts that we're we're asking for now, so that we would be able to adjust it with. 
the need for inflation or expansion. Um, we had spoken real briefly just before about um, basically the, the board's uh, fiscal stability and the board's um, revenue stream. This, um, I think uh, what I had, our rough estimate right now is that it is probably of a, of a let's say a $19 million budget. And if we say that the education program is about 12% of that, that's something like $2.2 .2 million a year. So if we wanted um, the program fees to absolutely pay for the entirety of that, I don't, I don't know that we could do that, at least not initially. But I think what we, what we can do here is if we lay out one of these scenarios and the potential revenue down here, and, and please excuse me, these are seriously rough estimates. And added to that, these also don't account for um, increases of new programs. And so if we, if we figure that we're going to be adding about 20 new programs a year for the next four or five years, you know, that changes things because it also changes the number of students, you know, two or three years down the road from there the number of people that we have as as licensees. So our our objective here, because and, and the board has said a number of times, and I have deeply appreciated and, and, and supported this, is that we should not consider raising applicant licensee fees until we are able to implement these programmatic fees. Um, and I, I remain deeply committed to that. So even though I think um, it, just this the strict on the paper math here it shows us coming up a little bit short of what i think we we do need to pay entirely for the education program i think this makes a significant amount of difference in our revenue stream and my hunch is that based on um the increase in the, the number of programs altogether plus the increase the eventual increase in the number of licensees we have, I think this buys us at least. Well, I I don't want to be you know held to this as, as a promise or, or or even a guarantee or anything like that. But my read on this says that if these fees are approved and enacted next year, um, it pretty much pushes back the insolvency or potential insolvency. And I think it pushes back our need to reconsider the level of our applicant licensee fees for, I think, at least one, if not two years. So generally speaking, I think overall this definitely strengthens our fiscal house. Um, the board, of course, you know, whether you want to choose one, two, three, or if you want to suggest something else, um, we'll, we will work that together. Madam Chair? Thank you very much. That was well presented. Are there questions from the board? Uh, Ms. Brown, I see your hand is up. I apologize. I never let it down. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Happens to us all. Okay, Ms. I Turner? Have, yes, thank you. I have two questions. Cheryl Turner here. Mm -hmm. And so we have the same initial fee for all schools. Well, at least you may try based on the number of students. But um, do you see any issue with schools that are ready to go, have their work in order, turn them in when they're supposed to do it? It's, it's very smooth versus those that are flat footed even after they've paid the fee and the NEC has to keep going back and forth constantly to um, ask for more documentation. Um, it seems like in that scenario, uh, they actually cost more uh, and are more of a burden on the NECs than the other school that's ready. Um, so that's one issue I have. I, I you know, I, I absolutely understand that. And, and the blunt reality, of course, is that there are probably going to be instances like that. Um, <clears throat> what we hope, what we fervently hope here 
is that by asking for the really large chunks of prep work up front, um, we really do carve down the amount of time. Um, the NECs have, have, you know, talked to me a lot about this, and, and truthfully, um, one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks that that requires the most back and forth time if they're not if the program proposers are not ready let's say is curriculum but if, yeah. if they have their curriculum ready to go that moves the process so much more quickly so much more efficiently um i i'm I, i'm not actually answering your question right thoroughly but um my hunch is that yeah we're still going to have instances like that and it is going to be a problem but if we're able though to make sure that most of these programs are moving according to to a schedule um that most of our problems go now the side thing that that i think helps strengthen that that possible problem is that language with regard to the communication policy so that if it's a matter of them not meeting deadlines or not communicating we are able to have some some consequences and, and hold them some accountable so that if they're if they're not responding if they're not holding up their end we can install some consequences with them and and either move them to the back of the line again or just say all right for the next six months you just go away and and, and work on your stuff and we'll come we'll maybe come back to you if we can, you know, that those those details haven't been really ironed out for, for in in steel language, but we will, I think, have some ability to address what happens if, despite our best planning, our best preparation, these things are still taking way too long. We are going to have to figure out some some ways to to work with that. All right, and then the next question is, uh, I, I'm not sure that I'm familiar with how much work, and I know you presented uh, data on the initial application process, but the continuing approval process, is that, mm -hmm. does that involve work, substantially the same amount of work as the initial application process? Oftentimes it's more. Oftentimes it's more, and, and, and this surprised me when I was um, learning about that, because um, the, one of the key things that, that um, programs are asked to, to provide after their first you know, four years is this program review survey, which is absolutely enormous. And as I was saying, when we were talking about the, um, the application process before, um, what I didn't realize was that this already enormous amount of information that the programs must provide and the NECs must analyze and, and, and assess is multiplied by the number of cohorts, the number of students. Um, and so it can be a lot more than the initial approval process. Thank you. Are there other questions from the board? <clears throat> yes, this is Taisha Brown. <clears throat> um, so how will this uh, change or, or will it change the timeline from 18 months to maybe prospectively six months and will, will the applicant see the difference? Will the school or um, No, I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, this is it. Will will the school see an improvement? Because this the whole thing should be, the time should be decreased. That's the goal, right? Yes, so absolutely. Okay. okay. The first, and I think the, the most significant uh, change in the amount of time, the shortening amount of time, is that we would not have a waiting list per se. We would have regular cycles of, of application. So there wouldn't just be people languishing on a list. They would be these regular every year or twice a year cycles where when you're ready 
if you have all this, if you have the ability to present a, a thorough package to present to the board, you'll be considered to, to move forward. And if you're if you're not, then you get to apply in the next cycle. So then truthfully, yeah, you could be waiting again for another six months. But the idea here is not to be put on a list where it takes a year and a half or so before you're even assigned to work with the NEC and then work for a year, year and a half um, to get your program up and running. So this, we, we, we absolutely think that this shortens the amount of time from the, the, the inception of a program to it, it opening its doors to students. We think that the best case scenario here is that um, from the time that they're assigned to the NEC to the time that they open their doors could be less than a year, could be eight, 10 months. Um, it, some of them are going to take a bit longer, I think to, to um, you know, back to, to Ms. Turner's point a minute ago, there are gonna be programs that need a little bit more work. But but remember, the idea here is that programs are going to be selected to move forward based on their readiness to move, their readiness to put their stuff together and get ready to admit students. So, so it's an incentive for them to get, have everything together and prepared to go. So, yeah, I like that. I think it's yes. a good idea. Thank you. Oh, I see Ms. Carpenter, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to verify this is a pilot program, right? This is the way we've we've described it to the legislature and we're um we're we're um working with some semantics because yeah, as you know, of course, Ms. Carpenter, this is not what you technically typically see in a pilot program that it's like we select three counties to try this out for two years. This is going to be a statewide program, but it's it's the same flavor. And the reason we, we wanted to try and explore, explore it this way is that by having a very finite amount of time to try it this way, um, we believe that we would be able to move directly into implementing it without then the subsequent need to, to, um, to develop well, to, to develop a lot of, of, of rulemaking. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking there would still be some, but um, we would be able to move immediately into being able to, to start addressing the, the, uh, the need for approving new programs. Yes, this yeah. is my understanding of the whole concept. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> See no further questions from the board. Are there public comments? I do not see any hands raised out in the public. So at, at this point, Madam Chair, what um what I would ask of the board is how they feel on first the recommendation that we just fine tune the approval of new programs and provisional approval that basically just kind of fine tunes what has been approved since May 2020. And then secondly, I would ask that the board think through which of these three models for the continuing approval fees that the board would like to authorize us to move forward. So at this time, do we need a motion? I'm, I'm just not totally clear. I believe we do. Uh, Ken Swenson here. Um, it depends on whether the board is prepared to move forward on any of these recommendations or whether it's going to refer the matter to committee for further study. The prior motion on item 4C, I think, adequately covers the B element as it relates to the pilot project. Um, and so this is... Um, something that hasn't been taken up by the, the policy committee yet. And so the board might want to consider referring the particulars of the fee amounts and its relationship to fiscal and budgetary issues to a policy committee, because um, at this point, 
we don't have a legislative vehicle to uh, move forward anyway. And so that will be in development. I, I think that the concept approval may uh, be sufficient uh, for purposes of moving forward um, if the uh, board doesn't want to um, make a determination on which of these recommendations I would like to follow at this point. Thank you. Actually, to, to supplement what Mr. Swenson is saying, um, the board should recall that um, the final word is from the legislature anyway. So what we had hoped to do is to provide the legislative committees with um, the concepts that the board feels strongly about, that, that we feel very confident that this is a, a solid recommendation forward. And, and I actually would expect that whatever we put forward is going to be subject to some negotiation and some uh, some possible changes from from the legislature. So So I'd so, like to make a motion to accept uh, if am I in line making the motion? This is Taisha Brown. This is the moderator. I do see a hand raised in the public. It's Toby. Would you like me to unmute his microphone, the Mountain? Uh, yes. One moment. Okay. Hi, I think, thank you again, Madam Chair and, and board members. This again is Kobe Pizzotti from the California Association of Psychiatric Technicians. Um, we just wanted to say thank you for uh, the proposed fees um, that are long overdue, and we believe this will help um, help with the solvency of of the board and able to carry out this uh, very crucial part of the board's functions. Um, we we don't particularly have a um, uh, preference as to which fee proposal and structure. Uh, you decide to go with. However, um, I think the structure in option two was probably the best from our perspective. We will, however, be pushing for the um, for the BMP committees to place in the sunset review uh, bill um, these fees as a part of the passage of the sunset review because we believe this is a critical part. Um, so, in terms of the vehicle, as I heard Mr. Swenson say, uh, we're going to request that any sunset review bill that gets passed, that these fees have to be uh, accompanying that. So, uh, we would sin sincerely like to thank you for all your hard work on these proposed fees, and um, we look forward to uh, seeing the final product. Thank you for those comments. Um, Ms. Brown, are you still comfortable making a proposal? No, I am not. <clears throat> Sorry about that. That's okay. Do we have a proposal? Madam Chair, um, Elaine Yamaguchi here. Um, Mr. Swenson, uh, Mr. Swenson's comments a minute ago it is absolutely true that if you, with based on the motion that the board approved, with regard to the overall program approval, because we did say that it was contingent upon the authorization for a fee structure, it does pretty much cover us at this point. But what I was saying again as well was that the amount of, of specificity and, and, and the, well, enthusiasm um, that the board has, if, if they had one strong recommendation, I think that would help um, move the case with the legislature, but at this time, I think um, we would probably be almost as well served by presenting them with um, these models for consideration and and discussing how that works. And of course, we would we would need to be working with uh, DCA's fiscal and budget shop to to address our own you know long range financial picture, our fund condition, and show how 
any of these in these uh, instances would change our, our long range stability. So, as I said, um, I think Mr. Swenson is correct that a motion at this point is not absolutely necessary, but some some uh, I think, you know, vocal. Uh, oh, I won't call it a preference, but if, if there was something that the board felt most more strongly about being a better a better uh, consideration, I would I would welcome that as well. Thank you, Ms. Yamaguchi. Uh, since we don't have anybody who's comfortable making a, a motion, Mr. Swenson, what is the best way to move forward at this point? One possible form of motion might be to make the issue part of what the executive officer negotiates with the legislative staff in consultation with the executive committee. So with the first part of the prior motion, you could include um, something there where you're identifying perhaps what your policy preferences would be in any uh, legislation. That might be a way of doing it where you wouldn't be committing yourself to any particular structure, but you would express a preference that Ms. Yamaguchi as executive officer could take into consideration in consultation with the executive committee when negotiations take place with legislative staff. Thank you. Is there a preference for the board? Is there someone who would like to propose a preference? Madam Chair, if I could make a recommendation at this point, then um, what I would suggest then is uh, based on, on, on Mr. Swenson's summation there, um, I would go ahead and move forward consulting with the, uh, the Assembly and Senate staff and provide them with all this information. But um, I believe the Executive Committee is scheduled to meet the second week of July. And I, I believe um, if all goes well, well, we might be able to have some action um, because this the sunset bill is scheduled to be heard that week as well. So I would be able to um, confer with the executive committee at that point and be able to move forward. And we would certainly, of course, keep the whole board apprised of what's going forward. So do we still, I include, do we still need a motion or can we defer this until after uh, that that time, I would I would say that we could defer any action and actually um, delegate any any action to the executive committee at its July meeting. And do we need a motion to do that? I don't think so, Mr. Swenson. Do you think so? If the board is delegating authority to the executive committee to make a decision, then. A motion would be required, and of course, if the executive committee is uh, authorized to act on behalf of the board in that regard, then it would require the meeting of the executive committee to be subject to the Bagley Kena notice and agenda requirements. Is there a motion to allow the executive committee to review and make that decision. Alita Carpenter, I make that motion. Is there a second? Okay, somebody speak the fuck up. Good Lord. Someone has a hot mic, they might want to shut off. Thank you. What? I, I, I can second Melissa Rubicava. Thank you. It, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Swenson, do I, I need to open for public comment or can we take a vote? I have a uh, it should, be, it should be open for public comment. Thank you. Discussion, please. 
is are there oh i see miss turner you have your hand up okay is there any reason why this cannot come back to the board for a vote that's the reason i didn't say anything um why do we need to have the executive committee make the final decision? They can make a recommendation, but it seems like the board should be voting and making the final decision. Uh, Madam Chair, if, if I might respond to Ms. Turner, um, the simple fact is the legislative calendar here. Mm -hmm. um, things are things are moving quickly and the the, the likelihood is that by the time the August board meeting comes around, everything will have been completely finished. And it, it, it might be that there's um, time to make any any recommendations um, if the bill is on the floor or, or back in the assembly for concurrence. But as I said, the likelihood is that between now and I would say the first week of August, is when this is going to be pretty much finalized um, so that the options then would be a to delegate to the executive committee and or b to convene another special board meeting but but again i want to caution the board members because the board may review and and you know accept or or recommend or or advocate for a specific bill language but as i said in the end the legislature will pass what the legislature wants to pass the governor will sign what the governor wants to sign so it may very well be that if the board has fine-tuned sorts of, of concerns or things um we may see that being a problem but if but this is this is why um we chose to move ahead with the, um, the concept rather than specific bill language because bill language is going to change even in this very very tight timeline so what we what we want to make sure is that the overall concepts the board has approved the board is endorsing those are what we will be able to negotiate to a some small degree but at the end if if in um my opinion and the executive committee's opinion any sort of language that's presented by the committee or amended in some way um, that absolutely counters what what the, this board has has described and this board has approved well again the the legislature is going to approve what the legislature approves um, i think you'll remember that the legislature has approved legislation that this board has not been very uh, fond of and and yet once it becomes law it is our our job to implement that law but um but as i said the process of negotiating these concepts and making certain that the language that comes forward is consistent with that that's why we have this somewhat intermediary step that basically the staff would be working with the legislative staff to um to develop that language and develop that plan but then by delegating to the executive committee we have that that check-in that ability to check in that um the the executive committee would be able to to just make certain that what we've agreed on at a staff level is still consistent with what the board has has approved has decided that they it is this is their policy Did that help? I see your hand is still raised, Ms. Turner. Um, well, I meant to take the hand down, but uh, I'm. will this come to back to the board for a final vote? Most likely not. No, oh, so we're complete. We're de delegating our vote to the executive committee. If we support the motion, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That answered my question. Okay. Are there other public comments? 
I see no hands raised at this time. Thank you so much. It's been moved and seconded to defer this to the executive committee. Um, I'd like to call for a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Brown? No. Uh, Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Durkin? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Maxey? Abstain. Ms. Rooks? Abstain. I'm sorry, Ms. Rooks, what, what was that? No? Abstain. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh-huh, you're welcome. Um, Ms. Rubalcava? Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Yes, my answer is yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Turner? No. Okay, and I am a yes. So we have five in favor, two opposed, and two abstain. Mr. Swenson, is that carried? Yes, the motion carries by majority vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We will now go back to 4A1, uh, updated possible actions, Mr. Durkin. I'm sorry, 4A1? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Let me just pull that up. I got out of sequence here, I apologize. Okay, 4A1 relates to the modified proposed text that we previously uh, reviewed. It was submitted uh, as a proposal by the Ledge Reg Committee at our May meeting. Unfortunately, uh, we did not have time to uh, provide the cleanup language. So uh, for today, we have modified proposed text in the attachment, which was received and approved by DCA Legal on April 1st, 2021. Uh, Ledge Reg, uh, reviewed the language at the May 6th meeting and moved and referred the modified proposed text to the board for adoption. And once again, 2138 relates to uh, the, the the barriers based on a purported uh, uh, criminal conviction record. Uh, it limits a regulatory board's discretion to deny a new license uh, uh, on application. The cases where the applicant was formally convicted of a substantially related crime or subjected to formal discipline by a licensing board and offenses older than seven years are no longer eligible for license denial with several enumerated exemptions. So uh, the Ledge Reg Committee voted to approve and submitted to the board. That's all. The Madam recommendation Chair. is to approve. That is correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we do not require a second. I will do a roll call um, and establish who is in favor. Uh, Madam Chair. Oh, yes, Mr. Simpson. We should have public comment, please. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, is there a public comment? There are no hands raised in the public. And I still think, Ms. Turner, your hand is raised. Would you like to make a comment? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, I will now take take a vote on the recommendation for for A one. Ms. Brown. Yes. Ms. Carpenter. Yes. Mr. Durkin. Yes. Mr. Hill. Yes. Mr. Maxey. Mr. Maxey. Okay, Ms. Can, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, now we can hear you. Did you want to vote? Yes. Mr. Maxey, thank yes. you. 
Um, Ms. Rooks? Yes. Ms. Rubel-Calva? Yes. Ms. Turner? Yes. And I am also a yes. That is uh, move forward unanimously. We will now move on to 4A2, update and possible action program pass rate standards. Um, Mr. Durking? Yes, this relates to uh, AB 1273, uh, Madam President. And AB 1273 is a work oh. and earn and earn. Mr. Durking, I think we skipped we, we skipped a, a couple. We're on 4A2 for the pass rates. I beg your pardon. Okay, pass rates. Uh, this is submitted for a 15 day uh, comment period relating to program pass standards for VN programs. Are, are we going to take VN and, and PT programs separately uh, according to the agenda, I believe? Yes, sir. Okay. For the VN programs, the modified proposed test text uh, for uh, board vote, this was also reviewed uh, by the Ledge Reg Committee at today's meeting, in fact. Um, on April 7th, 2020, DCA Regulations Council proposed various amendments to Section 2530, Article 5, Chapter 1, uh, Division 25 of Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations. The document program pass rate standards uh, were considered, and this relates to the 75% uh, pass rate with uh, other requirements imposed for uh, current programs for VN uh, schools. Uh, failure to maintain the yearly required average minimum pass rate uh, for one year or four consecutive quarters may cause to place the program on provisional approval. So Ledge Reg Committee um, looked at the language and we pro uh, this, this motion was approved to send to the board. Do we need to vote separately for the, a vocational nursing program? Or is this just for the vocational nursing program, not the psychiatric? Yeah, this, this is just this is just for the VN program. We have a companion piece for the PT programs. Okay. Are, are there comments from the board? I, I just personally want to say I think this is very fair, and that maintaining a pass rate of seventy five percent in a nursing program is crucial to producing nurses that are competent to go out and practice. Are there, is there any public comment? I do not see it from the public. Um, so we do not, since the recommendation from the committee, we do not need a second. Um, I'd like to take a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Durking? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Maxey? Yes. Ms. Rooks? Ms. Rooks? Hello. Hello. I'm, can you yes. hear me now? Okay. Yes. It's yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Rubel Kava? Yes. And Ms. Turner? Yes. And I am a yes. So that is passed unanimously. I believe, do we have to move on to, to the second half of that? Or are we... That just says yes, Madam Chair, sure. we do need to do the second half of that. Okay. I'll turn it over to Mr. Durkee. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the companion piece relates to uh, uh, PT pass rates. And legislature might, uh, well, indeed, will be concerned about how the PT programs uh, relate to uh, VN programs. 
and we think we have a solution with the modified language. So attached to the meeting packet are, is language that was uh, previously modified. We have proposed text with annotations. The modified proposed text was constructed to be consistent with the language for VN programs. Legislative and regs committee, uh, we uh, reviewed the language at our uh, today's meeting. We moved to refer the proposed modified text to the board for adoption. The uh, language parallels or tracks that which is re, uh, that which we uh, just approved for VN programs, 75% pass rate with uh, some probationary standards for uh, provisional programs. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Seeing none, are there any public comments? I do not see any hands raised in the public. Thank you. I'd like to take a roll call vote. Madam uh, Chair. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, this is Ken Swenson. I would invite any comment from the members of the board relating to the necessity of a 75% pass rate for psychiatric technicians at, uh, as opposed to vocational nurses. Thank you. What? Can you state the motion, please? I, uh, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, yes. My understanding from Mr. Swenson's comment is how do we specific relate? We specifically relate the the pass rate for P PTs with the pass rate for VNs. In other words, what's the nexus? I would submit there is a substantially similar scope of practice for mm -hmm. one with a a uniform uh, examination. I, I absolutely support that as well. Are there any further comments? Um, and the, the motion, uh, help me, Mr. Durkee, is to accept the recommendation of the legislative committee to accept this language regarding the pass rate of the psychiatric technician. Is that correct? That's correct, Madam President. Thank you. Does that help, Ms. Brown? Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any further comments from the public? Further comments from the public? I see no hands raised. I was giving them a minute to see if somebody would raise their hand. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, see, see no further comment. I'd like to take a roll call vote. Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Durkin? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Maxey? Yes. Ms. Rooks? Yes. Ms. Rubel Kava. Yes. Ms. Turner. Yes. And I'm a yes. That makes it unanimous. All right. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next item, which is A3. Uh, uh, 4B, Madam Chair. Oh, wait. Didn't we just do 4B? That was the psychiatric technicians. Oh, 4B. Okay. So we're moving on to AD 1273. Okay. All right. Mr. Durkin? Yes, I think that's correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now we get to the work and earn and learn program as amended. A proposal by member Rodriguez, AB 1273, creates an interagency advisory committee on apprenticeship uh, DCA and the state public health officer. Um, existing law provides for apprenticeship programs within the division of, of apprenticeship standards within the Department of Industrial Relations. And this is a, in, in my opinion, a, a step as we look forward, how do we move forward to not only uh, uh, cultivate, but encourage those who may be interested in the professions, healthcare professions, um, but who may not have the ability um, 
or or financial wherewithal to uh, engage in formal uh, program processes. So this would create the the committee to to uh, to expand really the universe of potential applicants. You know who might be a good uh, fit. Uh, you know, for the profession. So it's an opportunity to earn some money and perhaps credits for uh, those who would otherwise be interested in the healthcare profession. So uh, I, I hope all members have had an opportunity to review the text of AB 1273, as well as the analysis prepared by board staff. Uh, Ledge Reg committee members, we reviewed this two year bill at our uh, meeting today, and we moved to refer the bill to the board to adopt the formal support position. Ms. Yamaguchi, would you like to comment on this bill and its provisions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I, I just wanted to add a clarification that the, um, the Interagency Commission already exists. This bill is actually um, to add the director of DCA to that commission as an ex officio member. But we think this is a really important addition to the work that they do. Yes, thank you. I I, I beg your uh, uh, pardon on that uh, misstatement. Are there any comments from the board? Seeing none, are there any comments from the public? There are no hands raised in the public. All right. So, uh, I'd like to take a roll call vote on the recommendation of the committee. Are we ready for that? Mr. Swenson? Yes, it's ready for a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Carpenter? Yes. Mr. Durkin. Yes. Mr. Hill. Yes. Mr. Maxey. Yes. Ms. Rooks. Yes. Ms. Rubelkava. Yes. Ms. Turner. Yes. And I am also a yes. That moved. That was uh, unanimously voted on. I believe that we have covered all these sections. Just a second. Since we got out of order, I just want to make sure. Okay, are there public comment on items not on the agenda? No public comments. I do not see any hands raised in the public at this time. Thank you so much. Uh, then we will go to item seven, which is meeting adjournment. And this meet oh, suggestions for future agenda items. Are there any suggestions for future agenda items? From the board. Seeing no hands, are there any further public comment? Oh, wait a minute. Did someone have a comment? Are there any further public comments on suggestions for future agenda items? There are no hands raised in the public. Thank you so much. I think we will go to item seven, which is meeting adjournment, and this meeting will be adjourned at 3.53 p.m. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank, Thank you all very much, much for your hard work. Have a great day, folks. Thank you.